Welcome back to the videos on determinacy and stability. This is part two on applying the equations. In the last video, we had an introduction to the concepts and we saw how the equations are derived. In this video, we'll see an example for frames, we'll see an example for trusses, and we'll see an example for frames with all members rigidly connected, addressing a particularly useful trick. In the next video, we'll look in more detail at the concept of stability. We'll start the frame example by recopying the equation for DOI that we had before. This is a two-story, one-bay frame, pins at each of the bases, and one hinge on the right-hand side of the lower beam. Let's start counting the various terms in this equation. We'll start with joints, and we'll count as joints any location where pieces of the structure come together, or any location where they're supported by the outside world. There are six locations that count as joints that are indicated in the red circles. Members are any piece that connects two joints. We can identify six members. We now need to count restraints. Each of the pins prevents motion vertically and horizontally, so each of the pins has two reactions. Two and two gives us a total of four reactions. Lastly, we need to look at additional releases or additional conditions of equilibrium. We have one hinge in this structure, and so we count one additional release, or one additional condition of equilibrium. Now it's simply a matter of plugging into the equation, and we calculate that DOI for this structure is equal to 3. We'll check the work by removing three sources of indeterminacy and seeing if the remaining structure is still stable. So one change that we can make is to change one of the pins into a roller. Now the whole frame, globally speaking, is determinate. Globally speaking, there are three unknowns, two at the pin, one at the roller. We have three equations of equilibrium for the frame as a whole. We can't remove any more external reactions, so we need to start inserting force releases. I've chosen to add the following two hinges. This results in a structure that is still stable. Making any other release would result in a mechanism. It's difficult to see that now because we haven't covered stability in detail, so we'll return to this concept when we look at stability. For now, keep in mind that you can check your answer by removing sources of indeterminacy and seeing if the remaining structure makes sense. Before moving on to trusses, I'd like to make some comments about counting joints and members, because this sometimes confuses students. So I'll give you some guidelines. Count joints at the end of any segment. These segments are usually straight, but they don't have to be. That's why I've shown a curved beam at the top. Things can get complicated, so if there's any doubt, just count a joint if there's any abrupt change. In this particular example, I've placed two hinges that seem like they're in the middle of a member and I've placed a support that also seems like it's in the middle of the member. If this confuses you, just count joints at all those locations. According to these rules, these are all the joints that we can count. After this, just count members as any segment between the joints. So if we have the joints that are pictured here, we have a member between each one of these. Now let's finish this example just for the sake of completeness. We can count that we have 11 joints, that we have 11 members, we need to fill in the missing information, uh, reactions, and conditions of equilibrium. We have six reactions, two rollers, and two pins with two reactions each. And we have two hinges, each of which gives us an additional condition of equilibrium. We can plug into the equation, and we can find that in this case we have a degree of indeterminacy of four. The basic point of this quick example is to tell us how we count joints and members if it's a complicated structure and if we're a little bit confused about what's a joint and what's a member. Let's look at an example of the truss. Let's look at how we apply this equation. We have nine joints that are shown in red. We have 15 members that aren't annotated because it would make the diagram very messy. But you can pause the video now and count the members. Make sure that there are 15. Now you've counted the members and you believe that there are 15 members, we can count the reactions, two at the pin, an additional one at each roller. Those add up to five reactions. If we plug numbers into the equation, 15 members, 
plus 5 reactions minus 2 times 9 joints. That results in a degree of indeterminacy of 2. Let's now remove the annotations from the figure and check our results. For this check, I'm going to start by removing two rollers to make the truss globally determinate. This is a simply supported structure, pin at one end, roller at the other, so there's no other restraint that I can remove without making it unstable. We also can tell that the truss is internally determinate because it's made up exclusively of triangles. That's a very good indicator that we have a nice, stable, determinate truss. So we've confirmed by physical reason that the equation is telling us something reasonable. Now, we'll make a parenthetical remark about some drawing conventions that can sometimes confuse students. First, we'll start by looking at a structure that has a hinge just off the joint. You'll notice in this diagram there's a horizontal beam, there's a vertical member coming up, and the hinge is drawn below the beam, so the hinge doesn't actually intersect the beam. What this means is that there's continuity in the top member, and a moment is able to transfer across the joint. If I see what this looks like perhaps in a steel structure, we have a continuous member horizontally and a vertical member framing in with a detail that prevents moments from transferring into the horizontal member. In contrast, we can consider the situation where the hinge cuts across all the members, as is pictured here. In such a case, none of the members can transfer a moment across the joint. This is what we assume is the case when we analyze the structure as a truss. A detail might look like what's shown here, three members connected by a gusset plate, where the gusset plate doesn't allow transfer of moment across that joint. A difficulty presents itself in this particular case if you use the equation for frames to calculate DOI. If you calculate the equation for trusses, this is not an issue. But if you use the equation for frames, you need to just be very careful. And essentially you count one fewer constraint than there are members framing into the joint. And the reason for this is joint stability. In this case, there are three members framing into the joint, and I count only two hinges that effectively release the moment in two members. If those two members can't support a moment, the third one can't either. There's more that we could say about this, but this is a little bit of an advanced topic, so I'll leave it at that. Remember that if you're dealing with a truss and you're using the truss equation, this isn't an issue that you have to worry about. Let's move to the last example, and this is a trick that can be used for frames with all rigidly connected joints, so no hinges. But if you have what we would call a moment-resisting frame, all beams and columns, all connected with joints that can transfer moment, that is rigidly connected joints, this trick can get you the degree of indeterminacy very quickly. Looking at this frame, I don't want to be counting joints and members. That sounds very tedious and very prone to error. The method involved is first, cut all of the closed loops. What do I mean by a closed loop? I've shown one in red any part of the structure where I can draw a line all the way around and travel along a continuous path back to the starting point. When I make a cut in a frame member, I'm releasing three unknowns per cut, an axial force, a shear force, and a bending moment. Next step is to remove enough supports to render the frame globally determinate. And lastly, the degree of indeterminacy is determined simply by tallying up the number of unknowns that were removed in the previous two steps. Let's start by looking at the first step. I'm showing here all the locations where I would cut and I'm showing the number of releases at each cut. So at each location that I've cut there's the number three. That's because at each location I have released an axial force, I've released a shear force, and I've released a bending moment. Next, I'll remove enough supports to render the frame globally determinate. Let me start by removing three of the pins. Now this clearly isn't stable. This building would simply pivot around its left end and rotate to the right. So we need to add back in a roller. Now globally speaking, this is a simply supported structure, pin at one end, roller at the other. So I've removed all of the external restraints that I'm able to remove. 
We tally those up. I remove two pins for a total of four restraints, and I change the pin to a roller for an additional restraint removed. We can now add up all of the unknowns that we removed, 18 cuts to expose all of the closed loops, multiplied by three releases for each cut, five reactions also removed. That results in a degree of indeterminacy of 59. Now, this is a fairly high number. We would have to analyze this structure in a subsequent class. We would have to use either computer analysis or approximate methods. So we won't be seeing anything this complicated in this class, but it's a good example to really drive home how this trick is applied. Now, if you want to convince yourself that this result is the same as you would obtain with the previous equation, pause the video here apply the previous equation and see that the result is the same. This concludes the video on the examples. In the next video, we'll cover the concept of stability, which will now finally allow us to fully classify our structure as unstable, statically determinate, or statically indeterminate.